It felt amazing. It felt, you know, we we co-slept. The bond, some people say the bond happens at birth. You know, I, I, I feel like breastfeeding is where kind of the first nursing session, I feel like, is where really the bond takes place, for me, at least. Because to be totally honest, childbirth, and it's an amazing experience, but it's kind of like, oh, whoa, what just happened? I just gave birth to another human being. When you're breastfeeding, there's a quietness to it. You're just, there's a presence to it that keeps happening. You know, it, it's happening every four hours. It's that little bubble that you're in, just the two of you. Balloons, bazookas, boob, boobies, bosoms, boulders, cans, hooters, knockers, melons, honkers, jugs, rack, tatas, tits, torpedoes, guns, bust, doorknobs, coconuts, and our favorite one, the girls. Welcome to the All About Breastfeeding Show, where your host, Lori, highlights mothers just like yourself and goes beyond the surface questions and digs deep so they share not only their joys and happiness in their daily breastfeeding life, but also their pain and struggles and how they worked through them. Episode number 82, The Milk Stork. Welcome to All About Breastfeeding, the place where the girls hang out. I am your host, Lori Jill Eisenstadt, IBCLC. I hope you enjoyed last week's show in which I interviewed my brother Bruce Odes, and he works for security at the San Francisco airport as a lead security screener. Bruce gave us some really good tips on traveling with your milk and going through the security line. He also made me laugh with some of his stories of what happens in his daily work life. Today, I have a guest that is going to fit right in with the theme of pumping and traveling and going through airport security. Kate has a lot of fun stories about motherhood, breastfeeding, and pumping, and my favorite part This is when she shares her story of lugging two gallons of her milk. Yes, you heard me right. Two gallons of her milk through the TSA and why they thought she was transporting fish. This led to the birth of her exciting company called Milk Stork. I know you will enjoy this show. Let's get started. Kate Torgerson is mom to three amazing kids, including twins, and founder and CEO of Milk Stork, the first and only breast milk delivery service for business traveling moms. I would love to welcome Kate, mom to Jackson, Finn, and Zoe to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. You're welcome. We're going to talk about a lot of things, but I can't wait until the tail end, until we get to talk about your very interesting business. So you're a very uh, creative entrepreneur, and I can't wait to hear your story. <laughs> well, I'm happy, to, I'm happy to share it. Let's start out with you sharing a little bit about uh, where you grew up, the family you grew up in, and what life was like for you. So I was born in 1973 at Stanford Hospital, right next to Palo Alto, California. I grew up in a time and a place that was, I I say, super ordinary and also at the same time really extraordinary because it was also the beginning of Silicon Valley as we know it. My mom was a stay-at-home mom for the first part of my childhood, and my dad was working in Silicon Valley. One of the unusual things I would say about my childhood is that I had a, a mom who has a really strong wanderlust and she was always looking for adventures. So as a child, she was looking for an adventure buddy. I became that person at a very young age. At nine years old, she had a wild idea to go on a bike ride from Palo Alto to Santa Cruz. And we did that. At 11 years old, she wanted me to get become a certified scuba diver because that was something that she did. She was scuba diving off the coast of California a lot, and she wanted a dive buddy. So I became her 11-year-old dive buddy. I have a really unique mom in a pretty ordinary suburban place. Like Dora the Explorer. She just uh, she, she took you along for the ride. Yeah, I think she had kids because she wanted to have adventure companions, honestly. Well, that's okay. It's a, good, it's a good reason, as long as she doesn't like those adventurous moms that they don't somehow wind up with a kiddo that's really that's really skittish and afraid and fear of heights so you can only imagine what that might have been like for her. Uh, no she was great and you know she was somebody who 
thought critically about rules and was kind of always willing to break a few rules to have a little fun. And that is a really fun mom to grow up with. So her motto was rules are meant to be broken. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) So how did that impact on you? When you grew up and moved away or out of the house, were you kind of feeling like I've done so much, I'm going to lay low for a while? <laughs> or or was that, that adventure, that adventurism just come out in you and, you and you were just doing exactly what she did with you and you were looking for that in your own life? You know, I think it gave me a sense of that anything is possible. I think as a woman, she's an interesting role model because she, as we were saying, she didn't play by the rules. And so, you know, it wasn't like you're a girl, you do this boys do this. It was like, let's think of something cool to do and let's go do it. I don't think that I'm as adventurous as she is to this day, (laughs) but I think it made me comfortable with taking risks and finding the fun kind of beyond the lines. That's actually something really great to pass on to your children, not be afraid to take risks and anything is possible. Yeah. I hope to be as good of a role model to, to them as she has been for me. So this is a little change of the topic, but I'm curious, what's what's the one of the latest things she's done that you or the family members have gone, oh, my goodness. Well, this one's not too wild, but she and my dad just got back from France. They were bike touring in France. She's in her late 60s. He's in his early 70s. So they're I would say that's big. (laughs) So they're always kind of doing adventure trips. She still scuba dives, not as much as she did, and definitely not as much in the cold waters of California, but she still does that. She was a triathlete for many years. She competed in Ironman Kona at the age of, I think, 63. So she does not stop. Oh, she just did a huge bike ride um, over to Pescadero from Palo Alto to Pescadero last weekend. So Wow. So I'm also afraid to ask, how does this impact your children and what she does with them? (laughs) I, I don't want to know. <laughs> like, do you, is it okay to leave them at grandma's house? I, you know, there's always kind of a, my heart skips a beat maybe a little bit, but I know that she, as adventurous as she was with me, she's even more adventurous with my kids because, you know, as a mom, I think you, you kind of still instill the, instill the rules. And as a grandma, there are no rules at all. It's all fun and games and, and nothing mm-hmm. else. The most I had to worry about is uh, we're vegetarian. The worst I had to worry about was they just were dying to give the kids meat. So whenever I thought about leaving the kids with the grandparents, that was my biggest worry. You know what? We're vegetarians, too. And uh, (laughs) so far, I don't think my kids have had any hot dogs. So that's good. Your mother probably knows that there still is uh, this fine line with breaking the rules. Yes. Which rules to break? It's a, it's that's right. <laughs> so tell me, when you were young, did you ever think that you'd be doing anything like, let's say, the work that you were doing before you founded your company? I no way did I. I ne- never thought I'd be find, founding a company, and I don't think that you know when I think about what I wanted to be when I grow up, you know, whether that was in high school or college. I don't even know that mom was in that equation that early on. I wanted to be an artist and I liked making things. I I knew that. And I, when I had an idea, I always felt really compelled to follow through with it. And I think that's something that a lot of artists feel. I was a ski instructor for many years. I mean, I've always kind of just followed, I'd get an idea and I'd, I'd follow through with it. As I got into my more serious sitting down at a desk career, it was marketing and communications and, and things like that. But I still continued to be doing a lot of art. After I had kids, the art kind of became harder to do because kids take up a lot of space. <laughs> All the space that you put your art stuff? Yeah, the, the studio space suddenly was gone. And the ideas that I were having, that I was having as a mom, I mean, I, I actually feel like when you become a mom... You're constantly in the realm of pain points. There's a lot of pain points to being a mom. And so you're always looking for solutions, whether it's a solution for your kid, a solution for yourself, a solution for your family. So I was having lots of ideas come to me. I wasn't really taking any of them seriously until um, the moment that I came up with Milk Stork, which was when I came face to face with a huge pain point of being a breastfeeding mom. Yeah, we're going to talk about more Mm -hmm. detail later. I can't wait to hear. 
Did you ever have the discussion with your adventurous mom? Did she breastfeed you? She did. So I texted her the other day to get the full details and to ask. So yeah, natural childbirth, 1973, Northern California. And then she breastfed me. She thinks it was for about seven months. And she remembered, she was telling me, she remembered very specifically that I didn't want to take any bottles at seven months. And so she didn't remember how she got me to take a bottle, but she remembered that being just this moment of, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? I'm go- I need to go somewhere and she won't take a bottle. And that was, she also said that that was the era of hand pumps. And it was just so hard to pump enough milk at that time effectively to even have a bottle of breast milk. Yeah, here's what's crazy. It's like I that was me. I was still even earlier than that. And the the bigger pumps were like these big industrial machines. And it wasn't like that, like it now. And you couldn't get your hands on it. But what I've since learned, which I feel so crazy dumb about that I talk to women all the time about, you got your two hands, like <laughs> hand expression. Like I would use these like bicycle horn pumps mm-hmm. and these other syringe kind ones. And they were very painful. And now that I'm teaching women hand expression, I keep looking to the young mother that I was thinking, it just never occurred to me and nobody ever talked to me about it. And of course, that would have been a viable option. So I, I talk to women all about that now, because even if even we have good pumps, yeah, some women, I think they get very reliant on it and they need to know hand expression for several reasons. But one of them is. I can't tell you how many calls I've got from moms who are away from their pumps or they're with their pumps. Oh, yes. And if something broke, they forgot their parts, the tubing. And they're engorged. And they're engorged. And then I'm like, so I've spoken to some women over the phone. I'm like, can you go to a private place? And they're like, yeah, I can. Like where I usually pump. I'm like, well, just go there and call me back. And then they call (laughs) me back. And I'm like, do you have the bottle that you would pump in? Yeah, I have the bottle, but the pump isn't working. Do you have two hands? (laughs) And I said, you have two hands. And they're like, huh? (laughs) (laughs) And I walked them through hand expression. And the other thing I've learned as a lactation consultant, especially in the very early days of breastfeeding, is that if moms are having difficulty with breastfeeding and they need to remove the milk, hand expression actually gets out a lot more milk easier than a pump does. That 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 early colostrum and the very low volume, it's like it gets lost in the flanges and the whole yeah. kit. Yes, totally. And so hand expression is so much better. So I walk a lot of moms through that. But anyway, it's like your mom didn't know that I mom and like I, I like I'm attached to my right arm. Why I didn't even think of that is beyond me. Yeah, well, my mom was also saying, you know, the La Leche League was the resource. That was the mm. resource that you had. As effective as they were, there wasn't a lot of community support. I mean, you had really one place. She had one place to go to help solve that problem. And now I feel like, oh my gosh, there's so many more resources to moms, people like you, and then within the community and moms are even getting more help at the hospital level. I went to a La Leche League group, which was about 45 minutes away from where I lived. And there was a meeting once a month for an hour and a half. And that was it. And I was just talking to another guest and I know I'm dating myself, but there was on my bookshelf with reference to birth and breastfeeding, there was Thank You, Dr. Lamaz. And (laughs) there was The Womanly Art of Breastfeeding and Bradley's book had just come out. And that was pretty much it. Yeah. Before you had your first pregnancy Mm -hmm. and birth, did you think about breastfeeding? I know before you said like mom wasn't even in in the thought process, but once you were thinking about having kids, did breastfeeding enter the picture or was it something that as a matter of fact, you took a a childbirth classes and breastfeeding class was attached to it. So what kind of thinking and learning, if anything, did you do before you gave birth? Well, that's a good question because I'm trying to think when I knew that it was something that I, I was committed to. So for one thing, my, we, all of our kids were conceived through IVF, which is a very intense process. And it's something where you're very involved with your body and what your body's doing and how it's responding to medication. And the getting pregnant process was very intense and long for us. So by the time we got pregnant with the first, I think a lot of IVF moms can probably relate to this, is that you're all in. You want to do everything right. You want to do everything right for your IVF cycle to, to actually conceive the child. And then once you're pregnant, you're so thankful 
uh, amazed maybe that you got pregnant, that you want to do everything right. So once we were feeling, you know, around 12 weeks, feeling really good about how the pregnancy was going, I was immediately signing us up for lactation classes and (laughs) childbirth classes. Luckily, we are in Northern California, and it was also something that was recommended by my doctor. And so it was kind of like the next step was the childbirth and breastfeeding. I was really thinking of it as a step-by-step process. Mm -hmm. Pregnancy, birth, breastfeeding. And so the breastfeeding class that you took was separate than the childbirth class. I went to one childbirth class that included breastfeeding. And then I went to a separate class that was for, for both my husband and I. It was a partner class and it was about breastfeeding. And at that time, were you introduced to IBCLCs, to lactation consultants? Did you know anything about the profession? That was probably my first interaction with lactation because the class was taught by a lactation consultant. That was the first time that I had really spoken to, to somebody about lactation. And do you remember in your classes, did you leave the class feeling like you you learned a lot and were excited and couldn't wait to breastfeed and had no concerns because you felt comfortable with what you learned? Or did you feel like, oh my goodness, there is so much more to know. I've got to dive deeper <laughs> and I've got to have my IBCLC on my uh, speed <laughs> dial. And For one thing, I left the class feeling like, wow, this seems to be a little bit more complicated than I thought it was going to be. I didn't realize it was going to be potentially <laughs> this complicated. But at the same time, I felt really informed and I did have a, then a lactation consultant ready on speed dial. I did. Mm-hmm. I did have my Ina May book. I felt prepared. I felt like I knew what I wanted to do and how I was going to do it. I feel like I had a goal, you know, Okay. and I feel like my I also feel like my husband had a role to play in, in how this was going to go. Was he quite enlightened? <laughs> I think it was. A new experience for him, for sure. But it ultimately proved to be extremely helpful. Like, did they show videos of mom's breastfeeding and he got to see breasts? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just, it was a a little eye-opening experience for him. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And and he had never, he was not a guy who had a lot of experience with infants anyway. So this whole, this whole process was an eye-opening experience for him. Like, it's just one thing added on to the next thing. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So tell me about your experience with the first day or two of breastfeeding. What was that like? With my first child, breastfeeding came very easily. It, uh, it was, Whoa. yeah, I know it was a, I, he latched right away. Yeah. We had some, there was some pain a little bit, but I didn't have uh, cracked nipples. I didn't have, I think uh, the first time your milk comes in, that's a shocking experience, but What's happening to my boobs? It was like, oh my God, what, you know, I could have used some pointers on hand expression at that point, but it was a really great experience and it continued to be a great experience. He was very good at latching and staying latched. I think we had one nursing strike over an 18 month period and it lasted for a day. It was rainbows and unicorns nursing my first. That is not, yeah, that is not the case with twins, but that was definitely the case with the first. And the interesting in luck because you had twins afterwards and now you, if you didn't know it then, yes. you really knew it after your twins, what a different experience and how, it's it's weird to say how fortunate you were, but because there, there's still plenty of moms who breastfeeding comes fairly easy with them and their baby and they just find their, their groove and their rhythm pretty early on and it's just not that big of a deal. Yeah. And as, as equal of moms who have such a rough time that... We just can't believe anybody ever has a, an easy time. You know? That was what was really interesting about having twins, because with the first, I almost couldn't understand how moms were having issues. You know, not not that I was not sympathetic, but I, I, I didn't I just didn't understand them. Yeah, because when we have issues, they're compounded. And so oh, right. when you're talking to a mom, they're not just saying, oh, I'm a little cracked. I'm a little sore and my right. baby isn't sleeping that great. It's a whole multitude of questions. I hear from a lot of moms who are having a lot of problems. So what I want to hear from you is like, go back to that time and tell me about those feelings of blissful breastfeeding <laughs> that first week or two of life and, and, you know, really how it felt for you and, and how it affected your husband. And even though you know afterwards that that, you know, how, how special that was for you, but I'm curious to know how it felt for you. It felt 
amazing. It felt, you know, we, we co-slept the bond. Some people say the bond happens at birth. You know, I, I, I feel like breastfeeding is where kind of the first nursing session I feel like is where really the bond takes place for me at mm-hmm. least. Cause to be totally honest, childbirth, and it's an amazing experience, but it's kind of like, Oh, Whoa, what just happened? <laughs> I just gave birth to another human being. When you're breastfeeding, there's a quietness to it. You're just, there's a presence to it that keeps happening. You know, it, it's happening every, every four hours. It's that little bubble that you're in just the two of you. And my husband obviously was there and in the very, very beginning stages, he's like, that's a good latch. That's not a good latch, you know, unlatch. Don't forget to put your finger in. But I think, you know, once we got over those first few hurdles, it was just, it was what motherhood feels like to this day, even though I'm not breastfeeding anymore. It's just that feeling you have with your kids. Tell me about co-sleeping, breastfeeding while you're laying in bed and how blissful that is. Sometimes it's blissful and sometimes it's not. I think for the first, of course, you're told you're not supposed to do it. There's lots of mixed messages on whether you should do it or not do it. We decided that we were going to do it and it felt, we felt like a family. I felt it was a nice way for my husband to bond with my son also and to give him that kind of physical contact with the baby for us, it was it was a really great experience. I, to, I have to say, though, my son still likes to sleep with us. <laughs> <laughs> and he's five and a half years old. And still, every once in a while, we go to bed and we wake up and he, there's another person there. So I think it's something for him that continues to bring him comfort. We don't see that as much with our twins who didn't have the kind of luxuries of the first the first child. He'll eventually make his way and you'll realize that he's just never coming back. And then you're going to be like, oh, I know someone told me, you know, there's that last time that you pick up your child. I never want to think about that time. Yeah. The hard part for me is all those last times is that I was just so in the thick of it. And and I had three kids in five years, spaced them out like 2.4. And I, the problem is my thing is like, my awe is I never knew whatever was was happening was going to be the last time. So uh, I never knew I know. the last time that they were going to breastfeed. I never knew the last time that they were going to actively seek me out and mommy, mommy, and jump in my lap. Uh, I know. Without me saying, come here, come here, Alicia. Come <laughs> sit on this lap. Like, I just never knew when that last time was. And so it's more... I'm like more wistful about that. Like if they could have had a little thing go on their forehead and saying, this is the last time, pay attention, take a picture. I'd be crying every single day, especially especially all the last first times, you know, the last first time they walk, the last first time that they speak. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you just never get it, never get it again. So you conceived the twins via IVF, right? Yep. So did you stop breastfeeding in order to work on conceiving or was yes. the meaning natural? Well, so at that point, my, my oldest was 18 months old and I knew that I wanted to have more kids. I had a persuasive conversation with my husband to, to, to go for a second. Little did he know he was going to end up with a second and third, but um, well, that's, and even that, that's even better still. But I always say, I want to be a fly on the wall when women have that discussion with the guys about you know, what are they, what are they <laughs> promising them to get that next child? Yeah. So at 18 months, you know, my son, he was mostly nursing in the morning and in the evening at that point. And, you know, I, I felt a lot more tenderly about the evening nursing session than the five thirty in the morning nursing session, as I'm sure many moms feel that mm-hmm. getting up early for that one was kind of difficult. And we did know that if we wanted when we decided to have the twins, I was about 39. Well, when we decided to have a second child, I was 39. And so we did kind of also feel like, well, there's, we have to be kind of swift about this decision. But I was very nervous about the weaning process. I, especially because the second, having a second child was a totally uncertain proposition. So in in terms of saying goodbye to those moments, it was hard to say goodbye to the to breastfeeding my son with the not having the certainty that I would be breastfeeding again, any other children, but we did it because it going through that IVF process is very intense and would have been difficult if I was still breastfeeding. 
Yeah. But it was the right time in terms of weaning. I, I have no regrets. He one morning woke up and had Cheerios. It was okay. Cheerios instead of Milky. So what did he used to call it? He called, well, he, he did sign language with us. Uh-huh. So he did the, the hand motion mm-hmm. for nursing. That was his sign. Cool. So tell me about breastfeeding the twins. Oh. What was that like after the birth? Oh, <laughs> oh God. <laughs> Oh, you know, I was spoiled with the first (laughs) breastfeeding twins is hard. Tandem nursing was very difficult. My twins went to 37 weeks. So when they came out, they were in, in great shape. They didn't have one of them didn't really have coordinated sucking down. So when I would tandem nurse, my daughter would cause the letdown and my son was just kind of there for the ride. Ultimately, that wasn't a really effective tandem nursing situation because you want both both babies to be nursing properly. So he had a tongue tie. He had a small mouth. He had a bad latch. He you know, preferred one side over the other side. And so what would happen was that I was either and, and he was never and he was losing weight. He never was having he wasn't having great weight gain. So we went to a lactation consultant. She was, and I have a lot of milk. That was the other, which is great for twins. I have, I have a good milk supply, but he wasn't getting any of it. So I would nurse my daughter and pump on one side so that my son could get a bottle. It was just the cycle of nursing one, nursing the other, pumping, nursing one, nursing the other, pumping. And it went on and on and on for about four and a half months. And then when they were four and a half months old, they got RSV, which is a virus that makes, you know, they get incredibly congested. And at that point, they weren't and wouldn't breastfeed. So I started pumping and I ended up exclusively pumping for another 12 months to feed them. When they got RSV, were they hospitalized? No, they were not hospitalized. They were of an, uh, a good enough weight that they that they weren't concerned, so they were fine. It was just a very bad two weeks. And the pumping did that come off of the baby's just? I could even understand your son at that point, but your daughter just truly say strongly preferring the bottle, and you just right. didn't. Yeah. So you know. so with my first baby, I you know I didn't introduce a bottle for about eight weeks. With the twins, because I had a toddler and then I was nursing the twins, and I was trying to get one to become a better breastfeeder, so I would put him on the breast and then focus on him, and then my daughter would get express breast milk in a bottle while he was nursing, and then I would get try to get her back on the breast and he would get a bottle. So it, and it did. It introduced a whole element of nipple confusion, which was also something that I didn't have to deal with with the first child. I realized that nipple confusion is not a myth. It does exist. And it created a difficult, a difficult thing for us to overcome. Anybody could think about it because it's your own to uh, to label. I often think about it as not necessarily nipple confusion, but a nipple preference. Yes. It's like, yeah. oh boy, yeah. do they they know which nipple they yes. want. They're not yeah. confused. Yeah, nipple preference for sure. That's that's <laughs> a what much nipple preference. Yeah, and I think my, my for my daughter who had the potential of being a great breastfeeder, she was immediately liking the bottle. The other thing too, with twins and a toddler is that you're getting a lot of help and you need a lot of help just to, just to even get any kind of sleep, just to even get any kind of food in your mouth. So I took help where I could get help. It was a difficult experience because I had very high expectations for myself for breastfeeding the twins. And, you know, after having such a successful experience, well, what I felt was a personally successful experience, breastfeeding my first, all those decisions were hard. Anytime I felt like I was making a compromise, I really was judging myself, but they were okay. You know, they've turned out okay. So I think I'm much more, the the self that I am now is much more forgiving of that mom. Yeah, you get there, right? Yeah, you do. Yeah. I am curious when when they got sick and you started using the bottles, no judgment whatsoever. It's always just I'm always wearing my like the lactation consultant hat and just curious as anything. So they got very into the bottle. 
And I'm sure there was a part of you, as much as you were battering yourself, which, of course, I don't think you should have done, but mothers just do that and you have to get through that yourself. What kind of mental mind shift was that for you? Is it like, yes, I really don't want this to happen, but my goodness, it's certainly making things easier. No, it was not making things easier. So tell me, why wasn't it easier? Because I wanted to continue to breastfeed. I was trying so hard to get them both to stay on the breast. And I was so incredibly sleep deprived. I was exhausted. So what was your turning point when with everything that was going on in in your mind that you just, you know, we we just before we talked about last times, first times. Yeah. Was there was there this turning point in your mind that I I just can't anymore was struggling too hard and I'm just going to exclusively pump to actually be honest. I never quit. I kept trying. I kept trying and I just kept putting them on the breast and it was, I tried a nipple shield to try to, you know, do it that way. And sometimes I would have success and then other times I wouldn't, it wasn't so much my daughter. It was my son and the fact that he wasn't gaining weight. Mm -hmm. That was a little bit scary to me. I even tried breastfeeding them. I remember when they were like seven months old, I tried again. For me, I was committed to not giving them formula. And so that be kind of became my new goal. Taking a little break so I can share this info with you. I am really psyched to be able to share this next piece of news with you. My regular listeners are very familiar at this point with Momentum, the organization that I talk about on each show. You know the one that I say, save my life as a new mother, the organization that helped me find other mothers who were new at this whole mothering thing. They became my people. They helped me navigate that first year of motherhood and continue to mother me as I had more kids and my need for support through their toddler years and kindergarten years and elementary school years just kept being needed. I made lifelong friends and they were so helpful that I am doing all I can to continue to support the organization. I want Momentum to continue to thrive, and I want you, my All About Breastfeeding audience, to experience just some of what Momentum is all about. The ladies of Momentum have agreed to give my listeners a 14-day trial membership so you can see what this mother Center thing is all about at no cost to you. Just hop on over to allaboutbreastfeeding.biz forward slash podcast. You will see a link from Momentum, it's in blue, and you just click it on and it will bring you to the page for you to sign up for your free trial. Honestly and truly, there's absolutely no cost to you. This is just a great opportunity for you to enjoy the discussion groups and the blogs and webinars and educational pieces that are available for free for you. I will have a link to this in the show notes. And now, back to the show. So what did you do with regards to pumping? Do you, I, I love to talk to moms who exclusively pump and get some of their their best tips and tricks to pass on to another EP mom. <laughs> well, you know, the great thing about pumping was that I finally at that, and I didn't know this was going to happen, but because I ended up having to pump, I got time back with my oldest at that point because he would come and sit with me while I pumped. And I was really missing him. So... You know, with the twins, I was kind of in this triage situation and he was spending a lot of time with my husband. But every time I went and pumped, he'd sit with me and he would just snuggle with me. So it kind of, Uh yeah, it was kind of a a nice way to bond with him. And he had so many questions and kind of for me, a moment, I think he was like three at that point. And I could explain what I was doing and he could see it for a three-year-old son. I thought that that was a pretty nice experience for him to know what his mom was doing. It also, when he wasn't with me, gave me a time for some alone time with a toddler and twins. I never had any alone. And with my mother-in-law in in the house and my mom in the house and sometimes a nanny coming to help me or my friends coming to help me, it was the only time at that point that I was alone. And so I took it as an opportunity to relax. If you had a diary, Mm -hmm. you'd be telling that diary, I'm so glad I'm sitting here pumping (laughs) all alone by myself. Well, the other thing that I did, too, is, you know, when I first started working on Milk Stork, it was built on the pump in 20 minute increments, eight hours, eight times a day was when I worked on it. 
That's a cool part of your story. I love that. <laughs> yeah. So what, 20 minute, 20 minute pumping increments that the business was built on. Yes, absolutely. Did your son, did he ever act out pumping and make noises and put flanges against his chest? He absolutely built stuff out of the flanges and weird kind of spaceships out of the flanges. He asked me one time what it felt like, which I thought was a really interesting question for a three-year-old. He asked me if it hurt because it, obviously it looks like it does when you're hooking all that stuff up to you. He used to hold the, when I was done, he would hold the milk bags and he was, all, you know, oh, it's warm. He had lots of questions, lots of questions. Great. That's cool. Yeah. That's really cool. So you pumped for, did you say 12 months? On top of, yeah. So I think for a total of 16, 16 months, I count my breastfeeding term 16 months with my twins. So do you know what my next question is going to be, Kate? What? When's the last time you pumped? I don't know. Do you know if it was a conscious decision? I don't know. I don't remember it. That's an interesting question. You're going to go to sleep tonight with that on your mind. I know. I'm going to try to remember. I'm going to call you back. (laughs) Like, I should think that question is so important. But (laughs) one of the last moms I spoke to who exclusively pumped, she said that like every day she and she was in a lot of pain pumping. So it was not a fun experience. But she said every day she thought about quitting. Every day she thought about quitting. But then she never did. Today's the day. Then she never did. And then one day she said, today's the day. And it truly was her last day. And so she vividly remembers that very last day. Don't remember last day, but I will say this. I still have a packet of frozen milk in my freezer because it's like a little trophy. You're a lucky duck. I'm from New York and I and I I was home with my kids, so I hardly ever removed milk. And at a certain point, I did learn about uh, hand expression with my third one. Mm -hmm. And I had about an ounce of milk that I took out when she was somewhere under six months old. And I nursed her for quite a few years. And I kept that in the little bag with the twist tie yep. for, for years. And we moved from New York to Arizona when she was nine years old. And I still had that in there. And like with everything, leaving friends and family in the house oh, and yeah. everything, I was saying <laughs> my husband was like, the worst, like you keep acting like this, this bag of milk is like, that's <laughs> your worst thing about moving. And it, cause I was like, well, we can get a little cooler and keep it on. I, he's like, I am not doing that at a certain point. You have to go. You know? So I remember when I dumped that, I just put it in the sink and I turned it upside down. Oh my gosh. And it defrosted. And I just very gently let all the little milk dribble out and I cried. Well, so it's funny because we moved recently and we moved that packet of milk. Yeah, <laughs> I promise it's five ounces. It's in a nook bag. It's in our freezer. If I, you know what, there, there was so much stress with moving. We were moving three kids cross country, taking like two weeks to do it. And the moving van came that same day. So it was very, very stressful. I think had I not had all of that additional stress, I, I just would have told my husband, sorry, tough luck, too bad. We're, we're, we're taking this milk, <laughs> but, but I gave it up. But, you know, I'm, I'm weird in that way because I, I had home births and, under in one house we buried our yeah. placenta the other house we buried our placenta it was like i'm going through this grieving process and when we moved from one house to the other the only thing that made me feel better was that i could keep going past that house and i could uh, think about yeah. the placenta. yes but then when i moved from new york to arizona there was no going back so <laughs> but i think it's like these weird things that come back and i do think because a lot of people talk about placental encapsulation now and everything and so it's so it, like i'm not away from that mother baby birthing world. So yeah. I still think about that too. Let's talk about what I'd love to hear. We, we mentioned a few things, but tell me some, just even one funny thing, funny story that you have about breastfeeding or pumping. Well, so when I, the first few months when the twins were born, I was walking around plus a lot. If you came to my house, that was that you were just going to have to deal with that. And one time my son asked me if I could see out of my other eyes. That is funny. <laughs> That's probably, yeah, that one was, I was like, what are you talking? Oh, now. Okay. Oh <laughs> yeah. Now what do they say out of the mouths of babes? Yes. I call this breastfeeding confession. So even though it's a confession that no, it's, it's something that nobody, you never ever told anybody, 
but we all know this is a show that's going to be released to the rest of the world. So, you know, a lot of people are going to hear about whatever it is that you have to say. So do you have any interesting to talk about in that? I was thinking about this and I, I think my confession is that I probably could have been, I'm proud that I was able to feed my babies, all of them for so long. Yes. And, and you should be, you should sing that from the roofs. <laughs> It's hard work for any mom. It's hard work when you have a toddler and a new baby. It's hard work when you have a toddler and two babies. It's harder work when they're not breastfeeding well. And it's only another mom that truly understands that. Because even before I had my kids, like these stories kind of go over your head. You're like, oh, yeah, and that's too bad. Yeah. But you don't really get it until you're walking in that person's shoes, right? Yeah. And I, I have to say, too. Too, as a working mom of three kids, I have so much empathy and sympathy and I just, it's so hard to be a working breastfeeding mom. And so I, just for those moms who are out there listening and, and struggling and trying to do it, hang in there. You're doing a great job. Yeah. And I often say, like, I'm in awe of moms who do that because I think you have your full-time mommy job, a full-time regular job, and now you're taking on a, a job of pumping. Yep. And you're trying to do the pumping while you're doing your full-time job. It's it's crazy, outrageous, like how you even do it. It's amazing. Yeah, it is. It's hard. It's really hard. The business model that you have is very intriguing. So I'd love for you to share us if there was something, again, like this light bulb moment yeah. or yeah. something big that happened that made you think of this and just take it from there. So when the twins were about seven months old and I was doing all that pumping, I was pumping about a gallon of milk every two days. I was faced with a four-day business trip. On top of all the pumping that I was already doing, I was going to have to pump two extra gallons before I left. And I was going to have to deal with two gallons while I was, you know, generating two gallons while I was gone and then getting that back. I think that was around the time that I still tried. I was still trying to get the babies back on the breast. I was like, come on, one more time. Oh, on top of everything. <laughs> yeah. I'm still trying to get my babies on the breast. I knew that I was not, I, I was, I had committed myself to keep them entirely on breast milk. And so I, I wasn't willing to make that sacrifice for a work trip. So I needed to figure out a way. And there, the truth was there, were, there was no good way. They're short of sourcing dry ice in a hotel room. There was no good way to alleviate the need to have to add incremental pumping session sessions to create this extra stash. And there was no good way to carry milk home uh, or get it home while you were gone. And so I ended up lugging all that milk back. And I say that, um, you know, Milk Stork was born in the TSA line and then kind of conceived in my living room that was covered with toys because standing in that TSA line, I was like, this is ridiculous. My brother works for the TSA in San Francisco. So tell me what that was like going through. I mean, because they're used to getting little bottles of milk. Yeah. And you're talking about this lady who's coming through with yeah. a gallon of milk. Two gallons. Two gallons. What did, two gallons. What did they do with you? So I had put the milk into Nalgenine bottles, like plastic drinking bottles, because, you know, those packets, when you have, like, if you have 26 packets, they're going to get all squished and mm -hmm. and leak and whatever. So I had put them in Nalgenine bottles, which really confused the TSA people. And then what was the what was the rule at that point? Like how many ounces you were able to have per bottle? Was it still three? No, it you could no, you could take you can take any at that point you could take any quantity through. Okay. Um but then I had bags and bags <laughs> of ice because you know the gel packs just never stay cold and there's no good place to freeze them when you're in a hotel room. So I had gone to the ice machine at the hotel and then filled up like all my Ziploc bags and put those in the bag with the Nalgenine bottles of milk. And it weighed like, I don't even know, like 25, 30 pounds, you know, on top of my laptop and my luggage. And so I ended up dumping all of the ice out on the curb before I went through TSA because I didn't want to have to deal with melted ice with TSA. Then I went through TSA and of course you have all the anxiety of like, I don't, like you were saying earlier, I don't want to put it through the x-ray or I, I'm okay with the x-ray, whatever. Then you have to get the ins extra inspection because you opted out of the x-ray. And then, and then they were wondering why I had put the breast milk into these bottles instead of the packets. And I, cause I have so much of it. And then after I made it through that process, I had to go get more ice and get those Ziplocs refilled. So 
I went to one of the bars on the other side, you know, once you get through TSA and I was looking very deliberately for a female bartender to fill my ice. And I found one. She's it's, the first question she asked me was, are you transporting fish? Well, not exactly. Not exactly. Any, anyway, I made it home. The milk was fine. But when I got home, my husband was holding, you know, I was holding one twin. My husband's holding the other twin. And I told him, I'm like, I want to start a company. <laughs> and he, his first words were right now. <laughs> and I, I said, yes, you know, I feel really like I, I need to do this. And then the second person I called was my dad. And my dad had literally just retired. And I said, I need your help. And I said, I want to start a company that does this. Didn't question it for a second. He's like, all right, where should I start? So my dad is my co-founder. Sweet. And it's, yeah, it's it's been amazing doing this with him. I'm going to come back for a minute. There was a, a thought I had, because when I was talking to my brother, one of his trick, oh, I don't know about a trick, but he was saying not only the ice, but the gel packs, what happens now, this is currently like in the last year, what happens when those gel packs begin to defrost and they get like water droplets? I yeah. Use the word. Condensation. Condensation, yeah, thank you. Yeah. And then it gets onto the bottles and that turns you into a whole nother thing. And then now they can't let people go through with the uh, gel packs. So he would, one of his little tips was to tell people to just get rid of all of that and just assume you're going to lose a few bucks on gel packs. And then when you get on the plane, then ask the stewardesses, you know, bring Ziploc bags with you so you don't have to go to the bar. Yeah. And then fill them up with ice packs. And the thing is that my, you know, because he's a guy and he still doesn't understand because to me, at, from a breastfeeding mom who's carrying all this milk and pumped it all, like I'm now stressed out. Are they going to have enough ice? Yeah. Are they, you know, are they going to give me it? Are they going to think they need it? You're going it from one pastures? freezer. <laughs> You're going from one freezer to, to one ice bucket to the next, you know, like right. so predictability. It's like, <laughs> right. So it's like, I mean, there were things that he would tell me and I was constantly doing this. Well, yes, but yes, but. And then he's looking at me with his eyebrows like, OK, you just kind of shot that thought down. Well, I'm happy to say our milk store coolers actually really comply with TSA. Great. So tell me about that. So now your father's in business with you. What's like the first thing that you both do? Well, the first thing we needed to do was figure out how this was going to work. It's a complicated logistics. Basically, it's cold chain logistics. We needed to come up with a cooler that was going to work for moms, that was going to work with breast milk storage guidelines, that was going to work with shipping, that was... And then the, the shipping for us is a kind of an interesting thing because we're shipping coolers to a mom who is then shipping them back to a third location. We had to just kind of figure out how this whole thing was going to work. We just started chipping away at it piece by piece. How did you prove your idea? Like, you know that this is something you really wanted. What did you do, if anything, before you really started to dive down deep and spend time, money, and energy on putting this together? Did you do anything to find out if there really was a need? And, well, I know there's a need, but that people are willing to pay for it. I just went for it. I knew that if I had... Like I knew that if I was experiencing this and I had seen moms walking through airports with their Medela bags, mm -hmm. I, you know, I know enough moms who have like endured this, that I knew it was a thing. I knew that taking your breast milk through TSA and pumping on a business trip was, was a thing that was painful. And it was a pain point that needed to be solved. Yeah. I had no doubts. I had no doubts. So how long did it take from the idea, the con the conception of the whole <laughs> idea, to finally putting whatever all the little pieces to the puzzle that you had to put through and hoops that you had to jump through, that you were one day now in business? So the idea was May, June of 2014, and the launch was August of 2015. 40 weeks. <laughs> Could have had a baby. So tell me what, uh, like if you were trying, well, not if you were trying, I want you to talk to my listeners and just give us like, what is this about exactly? Because we're talking about it. Yeah, I know yeah. details, but tell us exactly what your company is and what you do. So what we do is we provide moms with everything they need to send their milk home. So a mom goes to our website, www.milkstore.com, and she can place an order up to a year in advance. She enters her check-in dates, her check-out date, where she's traveling to and where she wants her milk sent. And then when she arrives at her hotel, there will be a pharmaceutical grade shipping cooler for each day that she's away. The cooler holds 34 ounces of breast milk. 
it provides refrigeration for a minimum of 72 hours. And what's great about the coolers is that she doesn't have to worry about freezing anything or finding refrigeration. She just has to push a button. And the coolers work on an evaporation technology that, that again, provides 72 hours of refrigeration. So then she pumps according to her normal schedule. And we have breast milk storage bags that are provided in the kit. And then she takes her kit, uh, presses the button when she's ready to send it, takes it down to the front desk. And the kits are pre-labeled and pre-addressed with FedEx priority overnight shipping labels. So it's overnight at home. The one thing we do ask is that moms coordinate the FedEx with their hotel. Every hotel has a different kind of FedEx setup. So it's important to know if your hotel can assist with the, with the setup. Now, is there any reason why the mom needs to get into details about what this actually is in the bag or box with any hotel staff, or is no. it just treated like any other package and you don't have to explain to them what you're sending? You don't have to explain to them what you're sending, but I do think that it's important to let the hotel staff know that it's something that does and does indeed need to be handed off to FedEx, that it's a, mm-hmm. you know, it's a perishable shipment. No, they don't need to know. Any funny stories that you found or that moms have told you or you've experienced about this whole process? What I didn't anticipate, though, was that companies were going to be reaching out to me. And the minute we launched, and within two weeks, I had a company contact me that wanted to provide this as a benefit to their working moms. Yay! That's- and since that time, I would say we have about three to five companies contacting us weekly to bring this on as an employee benefit. Wow, that's huge, Kate. So in my mind, I'm hoping that no, no working mom is paying for this and that um, companies are providing this to them. Fabulous. So is the, uh, this might seem like a crazy question, but is the working mom your average client? Yeah, I, I would say most of the people coming to our site are working moms. We do have moms who are going for that first getaway. So we do have mm-hmm. those, but for the most part, it's Monday through Friday travelers who are, and, and frequent, we have, you know, regular users, people who are having to travel because it's part of their work. Yeah, it's fabulous. What, what's some of the feedback that you've gotten that you didn't expect or that just feels really good? Oh, I think anytime a mom says that this made it so much easier, or, you know, I had so much anxiety about leaving my baby for the first time and at least I didn't have to worry about this. Anytime I hear that it's a win. It, it feels good to know that I can help moms. Now, as a, as a lactation consultant on a regular basis, when, when I help moms, it always feels really good. And there, there are some times when the new mother, the newly postpartum mother, comes in with her mother or her grandmother mm-hmm. to a consult, and they see everything that we do and, and how helpful we are. And then frequently they'll say, wow, this was like, you know, I just had no idea there was nobody like you when it was my turn. I, and they often say, I, I wish I had someone like you to help me. And then I look at them and say, I wish I had someone to help me. <laughs> That's one of the reasons why I want to do the work that I'm doing, because I'm motivated because I didn't have this. So I wonder, are those things that you tell yourself like, geez, it would have been nice for me, right? Yeah, I have never benefited from the service. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been nice. It would have made that trip. But then, it, you know, yeah. I, I, then, then I guess you wouldn't have had a business. Yeah, right? I wouldn't have had a business. All right. So I would love for you to tell me if there's anything else that I haven't asked you that you wanted to share with my All About Breastfeeding listeners. And if you do, let's let's say it. And then what I want you to do is just give us any information that my listeners need to know if they want to find out more about you or your service. Okay. Um, Well, I think the one thing that I would say to especially working moms out there and, and new moms, it's something I wish someone had told me is that there's, there's a big difference between being a great mom and being a perfect mom. Like don't confuse the two. There, there is a margin of error in parenting and, and your kids are going to be okay. And if you know, I, there's so much stress in those first three months to do everything right. And you don't have to do everything right to be a great mom. So I, just be kind to yourself. That's what I would say to, to new moms and working moms. If you want to learn more about Milk Stork, you can go to www.milkstork.com. You can find us on Facebook and you can also follow us on Twitter at Milk Stork. Fabulous. I, I'm still stuck on 
that there's a margin of error yep. with parenting. <laughs> yes, there, I love that. There is. You don't have to do everything right. I'm going to quote you on that. I love that. <laughs> It's not a zero sum game, you know, you do your best. And, uh, you know, it is so, it is so right. And yet as women, boy, we just put ourselves in the mill, don't we? Yeah, we do. Uh, I wish I could follow my own advice, but. <laughs> I, I yeah, well, you, you, you maybe don't a hundred percent, but uh, I'm sure you do it. Like, as I went on in my mothering, it was easier for me to follow that advice at, at some point that I did get it. And years ago I took this class and it was really all about being the good enough mother. And to me, initially, good enough sounded like not good enough. And but then when I, once I listened and I heard it was really all about that, there's there is a margin of error. You're not going to screw your kids up too bad. <laughs> and, you know, there's no such thing as a perfect mother. And there's the good enough mother. A good enough mother can be the great mother. Yes, absolutely. I agree. All right, Kate. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, this has been fun. Thank you so much for having me. You are welcome. All right. I think it's wonderful that companies are contacting Kate and are learning how they can help make travel time for their breastfeeding moms less stressful. I hope you take a few minutes to check out her website and see what she has to offer you. Kate has been kind enough to create a special discount for all about breastfeeding listeners. This show is being aired on Monday, August 1st, and this offer is available beginning Tuesday, August 2nd. When you make a purchase on milkstork.com and you check out, use the code B as in boy, F like Frank, 2016. That is BF2016, and you'll receive a 10% discount on all orders placed from August 2nd to August 31st, 2016. You can keep the conversation going about this show or any other All About Breastfeeding shows by joining the All About Breastfeeding community on Facebook. Just search for All About Breastfeeding community. Make sure you put in the word community, otherwise you'll be directed to the wrong page. I look forward to joining our group. You can also check out allaboutbreastfeeding.biz forward slash Skype. This is the place to go to find out more detailed information about how to schedule your private consult with me. Many moms choose this option before your baby is born so that you can have all your burning questions answered before your baby is born. Thanks again for spending time with me on another great show. I can't wait to see you for the next show. Until then, bye-bye.